Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, everybody from near and far. We thank God for the privilege of this 24th day of the first month of the 23rd year, the third decade of this century and third millennium. We thank God for Tuesday manna, and we thank God that we are together again. Tonight, we will take our stand in scripture in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 12 and concluding at verse 23. Let's pray. Gracious, ever-living, everlasting, ever-loving God, our Savior, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that this day has been beautiful we thank you for the sun. We thank you, God, for the radiance of your goodness and your mercy uh, through nature. And even as we are preparing for snowfall, we pray, God, that you will secure us and you will keep us safe. And uh, even if you would allow it to pass, our way or pass by us, we certainly wouldn't be terribly disappointed. But we know, God, that we need snowfall. We need the water that is generated. We know that we are in uh, this particular climate and uh, we need all four seasons. So we thank you for summer, winter, springtime, and harvest. Bless us, God, as we inquire into your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Illumine our way through your word. We thank you, God, for our global study community, those who are nearby, those who are around the country and those, God, who are around the world. We thank you and we praise you that you allow us to connect. And we look forward to what you have to share with us tonight through your word in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter four beginning at verse 12. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali. On the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. 
and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Do we say thanks be to God? I find it fascinating that Matthew uh, depicts this beginning, if you will, of Jesus' itinerant ministry. Uh, and uh, one of the things that has really uh, shaken me, and even though I have read this passage uh, periodically through the years, is where Jesus was and who he called. We know for a fact that Jesus had an intimate circle of 12 male disciples. He certainly had female disciples, but uh, the emphasis in all of the gospel accounts focuses on the men. And I think that in part, uh, Jesus reached out to the men, not just because it was a man's world, but uh, men are a little more difficult <laughs> uh, when it comes to embracing the things of God. I don't think that I would have much argument on that note. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, we're just wired a bit differently. Women tend to embrace uh, the things of God. And when we speak specifically of Christianity, uh, we don't see the hesitation uh, in the account that uh, on the part of women as we see of men. And maybe this is why Jesus uh, organized uh, his ministry uh, primarily and, and not exclusively, but, uh, and I, maybe I shouldn't say primarily, but Jesus had a ministry to men. And we know that that ministry is yet needed when 80% of our congregations are women-driven. <laughs> uh, we might as well tell the truth. If, if the women evacuated the church, uh, I don't think that there would be, as we know it, the church. And it does not matter if it is a very small ministry, a, a house ministry, or, or whether it is what we call a mega church with thousands of people. Most of those spaces and places are occupied by women. So it was necessary 2,000 years ago for Jesus not as a chauvinist, but certainly as one who wanted to include all of humanity, Jesus knew that, that he had to focus a, a good deal of his energy <laughs> on the brothers. And uh, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why uh, it is more difficult for us uh, to embrace uh, the things of God, but uh, it is the truth. The other thing that fascinates me about this particular pericope or passage of scripture is that Jesus leaves his home environment. Now, remember, when uh, Jesus was uh, around two years of age, his parents had to flee uh, their hometown, 
Uh, they had to flee because King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. And uh, you remember that story in chapter 2 of Matthew. And uh, Jesus and, and was taken by his parents into Egypt. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we know, uh, and this has nothing to do with uh, racism or any other kind of ism, but uh, Christianity is rooted and grounded in African soil. Amen. That's just a historical fact, and there may be people who want to whitewash it or contradict it, but uh, they would have to tear pages out of the Bible uh, to uh, prove their point. <laughs> uh, but uh, after Herod died, Jesus ultimately came back uh, to uh, Nazareth, and there he grew. And there was an age of obscurity. We, we know that Jesus uh, had uh, origin stories told about him up until the age of 12. But from the age of 12 to the age of 30, uh, Jesus lived uh, a relatively obscure life. There, there, there are no writings about him. But according to uh, Jewish law and tradition, when he reached the age of 30, which was the age of uh, public ministry where he could be uh, classified as a rabbi, uh, Jesus appeared, he emerged, he goes to the Jordan, Jesus is baptized by John then the Spirit of God drives him into the wilderness where he has a season of temptation. And uh, because of who Jesus was and, and, and how Jesus was wired and, and how Jesus absorbed as an observant Jew uh, the scriptures, he could not only contradict the accuser, the Satan, but he could overcome the enemy. And it was at this particular point that Jesus uh, set out uh, to minister. Uh, he was uh, uh, baptized and ordained, if you will, in the Jordan River. He was confirmed, if you will, uh, in the wilderness. And then for the next three and a half years, uh, Jesus ministers. And uh, so he doesn't have an awful long time to get his point across. But uh, Jesus does something that I think we uh, don't pay close enough attention to. Jesus leaves the environs of Jerusalem and Jesus goes into the region of Galilee and specifically Jesus goes into the coastal communities and uh, he goes to Capernaum. He goes into a fishing village and there, according to Matthew, Jesus calls two sets of brothers uh, to be his footstep followers, his disciples. And he does this after John had been arrested. And uh, we know that John was uh, subsequently martyred. He was beheaded. And uh, Jesus uh, begins his ministry. He was not in competition with John. John was not in competition with him. As a matter of fact, they worked seamlessly together. Uh, there was really no uh, tension or friction. Uh, and uh, we, we find that uh, to be true. 
So from Matthew's perspective, uh, John passes the baton to Jesus because he knows that Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus bypasses the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus bypasses the Sanhedrin. He bypasses the halls of learning where Gamaliel, one of the greatest scholars of Judaism, had residence, according to Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. Jesus bypasses all of the most likely to succeed, and he goes into Galilee, into a fishing village where people, men <clears throat> specifically, earned their bread by the sweat of their brow. They risk their lives going on to uh, the waters, going into the waters of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, uh, to uh, fish. And uh, they were not, these, these brothers, two sets of brothers, were not casual fishermen. Uh, they fished for a living. Uh, they provided economic stability for their community. I would imagine that in lean times, uh, they didn't sell all of their fish. I would imagine that they gave some of their fish away <clears throat> so that people could eat. Uh, they were vital. They were needed in this community. And uh, they were uh, valued because they provided the protein staple for this community. But these men were not educated. Uh, they were rough around the edges. I'm certain that they were wise in their trade and uh, they may have even been streetwise. Uh, they, they had to uh, negotiate. Uh, they had to balance a budget. Uh, they had to learn not to be taken advantage of uh, when they sold uh, their fish. So uh, they had a native, uh, intelligence, but nothing that was smoothed out or formally uh, polished. And uh, we, we know that uh, that's the case because if we go into the book of Acts uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit uh, goes, invades the upper room and fills them and rushes them out into the streets. And they began speaking in the native language of the people who had gathered uh, for the feast of Pentecost. Um, they were accused of being drunk. Peter reminded that group that it was just nine o'clock in the morning and uh, the, uh, the wineries and, uh, and places that sold intoxicating beverages were probably uh, not open. It was just a little too early. But uh, that's another subject <laughs> for another time. But they were also accused of being unlettered, unlearned. And uh, that went against the grain. That, that went against the, uh, uh, the, the social uh, conventions of the day. I mean, to be respected uh, as a religious leader, uh, one, especially in observant Judaism, one... Uh, was to exhibit some scholarship. Uh, Jesus was not formally trained. 
Now, I know that you may say, well, Jesus was the son of God and, and you give him a pass for that. But the reality of the situation in Jesus' humanity, Jesus was not formally trained. And you and I cannot escape that fact. I find it absolutely fascinating, and, and I have been a partaker. I uh, certainly do not eschew uh, or denigrate education. For those of you who have been around me, uh, you know a bit about my resume. You know, I've been to a few places and uh, I've been taught a few things. <laughs> uh, but uh, those of us who have studied uh, Christian theology have studied the life of a man who himself was not formally academically trained. And neither was any of his immediate followers. And some of us have spent tens of thousands of dollars to study the life of Jesus. And then we're examined. We write papers. Some of us write books. And then we crown ourselves with degrees. <laughs> and we robe ourselves. And congratulate ourselves. <laughs> As if we're doing something great. I, you know, I just... I want you to think about that. I am not anti-intellectual. But I know that if those of us who study the word of God have not first been called by God, our studies are in vain. And I, I just needed to throw that out. I, I heard my mentor, uh, Dr. Charles G. Adams, say something, and I have embraced it. Dr. Adams said, before I went to Harvard, I went to Jesus. <laughs> I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place. And he has made me glad. I, I just need somebody to hear me. <laughs> you know, because some of us parade and prance around uh, with diplomas and, and degrees as if we are more important than someone else. And it's not the case. I, I need to do a little more fact checking on this, but a story was told to me around the turn of the century at Harvard College of uh, a scholar, a, 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 a wonderful man who was uh, the chair of the English department. And... Uh, he chaired the department for 50 years and did not have a PhD. There were PhDs in his department that looked up to him. And Harvard celebrated him because he himself had uh, a genius, had an anointing that qualified him, not so much academically, but qualified him for the position. 
there are people that are doing things now that don't have formal education and, and we make a big deal of them. Uh, there are uh, people in a variety of industries. There are people who are in entertainment. There are people that are in athletics. There are people uh, that are doing all kinds of amazing things and have done amazing things and they have no formal education, but we look up to them. Think about the great artists. Somebody tell me if Grandma Moses had a formal degree or Salvador Dali. I mean, I just need to know something. <laughs> this is why I thank God that God is teaching me not to look down on another human being unless I'm extending a hand to lift them up. There are an awful lot of people that have passed our way. I see the name of, of, of Reverend C.L. Franklin uh, written uh, on this feed. Uh, Aretha Franklin didn't have a formal education. And she is yet known as the queen of soul. I am not attempting to talk anybody out of getting training. I just want somebody to admit and confess the fact that school is not the end all and be all of life. Carter G. Woodson said you can be miseducated. So, I mean, Jesus went to a fishing village. He had 12 disciples and four of them were fishermen. That's a third of his crew. And he poured himself into them. And he did not take their instincts away from them. He just told them, he says, you're fishing for fish, but I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. Teach you how to catch souls. Teach you how to change the world. And I know that the Bible says that they immediately left their nets and followed him. Ultimately, they did. But I can't imagine that uh, they didn't have a conversation <laughs> before they picked up and followed Jesus. And isn't it interesting that uh, the sages, the scholars, the academics uh, didn't come into the village uh, to recruit any of these people. They, they bypassed them. And maybe that's what made Jesus so attractive to them because he did not bypass them. He came to their situation. He identified with them. They saw in him what they saw in themselves. And that's what makes a servant leader. I was telling you about this great book, Servant Leadership, by Robert Greenleaf. I mean, there are people that have a, a, a servant instinct. And, and I argue that that potential is in each, each of us. But we've been miseducated. We think that we're supposed to be leaders first. I hear people all the time say, oh, that person is a natural born leader. If they are authentic, they are a natural born servant. That's why people ultimately follow them and they're not bamboozled or led astray. Servants ultimately become leaders and they don't seek to be leaders. 
but they identify with people who are in the struggle. <clears throat> I mean, if Martin Luther King had remained on a high pedestal of academia and everybody wants to celebrate the fact that he had a PhD uh, from uh, Boston University, they want to celebrate the fact that he had uh, an AB degree from Morehouse College. They want to celebrate the fact that he uh, was an alpha and, uh, and, and was boule and, and all of this other kind of thing. But that's not what a, none of that would have gotten people out in the streets to march. <laughs> Help me somebody. None of that would have gotten people, uh, to, to boycott, uh, a whole bus system in Montgomery, Alabama. None of that would have gotten people to risk their lives and be fire hosed and beaten and bludgeoned and, <laughs> and bitten by dogs if he were so high minded that he could not relate. The reason why the folks got with him was because he knew how to put on overalls, go into the community, communicate with people on every level. And toward the end of his life, it was the high and mighty that turned their backs on him. But the masses of people never turned their backs on Martin Luther King Jr. Because they saw in him a servant. They saw in him somebody who was willing to risk it all to deny himself of creature comforts. put his future on hold to sacrifice his family to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Those are the people that mean the most to us. Before I went uh, to bed last night, I uh, wanted to get a couple of uh, quotes together. I want you to listen to this quote from Maya Angelou, and I know that I have butchered it, but I have it right now. Maya Angelou said, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Glory to God. Now, this other quote, again, I have uh, misattributed, but this quote came from President Theodore Roosevelt. And it says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's what made Jesus who he was. He made people feel their worth. And he cared. And if you and I along the way don't care about people and don't help people feel their worth or their potential, we are wasting our time. And if you purport to lead somebody and, and nobody is following, you're just taking a walk. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Jesus tapped in to these brothers. And, and I have no doubt 
that he had conversation with them. I know it, it appears uh, through scripture. Scripture uh, sometimes is a telescope. It doesn't tell us everything. It, it gets uh, to the heart of the matter because if the fullness of every dialogue were written, we could not carry the Bibles. They would be so big, they would have to be enshrined in libraries. And even the libraries of the world would not be able to contain all the commentary. It's much like when Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda and the man was there for 38 years. <laughs> And, and Jesus finally asked the man, do you uh, want to be made whole? And the man uh, started giving Jesus his life story and Jesus just cut him off. He said, if you want to be made whole, pick up your bed and walk. I'm certain that if the whole dialogue had been recorded, that would have been a couple of chapters because the man had been in his predicament for 38 years. That's a lot of bottled up frustration. Yeah. John Frazier talks about the school of hard knocks. I call it the school of lifelong learning. It's the same thing. <laughs> but failure can teach you something if you're willing to learn. Because you can fail a hundred times. You only have to succeed once. To get on about your business, to, 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 to move on up a little higher. Somebody ought to help me praise God. While other people were disregarding the masses, Jesus went to the masses. He went to the grassroots. And, and that's, that's really the dilemma of the church. We want every, we want to profile people. We want people to come to the church. They don't have any issues. They've got money to give and, and, and they look nice and they dress nice and, and, and they're well educated and, and we're impressed with them. Those are the kind of people we want to join our churches. Now, there's nothing wrong with such uh, people joining. I, I think it's a beautiful thing when we can have a mixed multitude. Where we have people that are able, where we have people that are resourceful, who will link arms with folks uh, who need a helping hand so that we can lift each other up. Most of us, most churches, they want somebody else's members. <laughs> Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Yeah, it'd just be wonderful if, if we opened the door of the church Sunday and, and we got 100 members from somebody else's church. <laughs> that, that, that. That would, wouldn't that be wonderful? I, I, we would think that all our, of our problems are solved. But what Jesus did, Jesus didn't go to the synagogue to recruit. Jesus went to the seashore. He went down by the water where the fish were being cleaned and where the fish were being harvested, where the aroma of fish were, <laughs> And that's where he recruited his successors. God help us. 
We say that nobody wants to come to church anymore. I, I don't think that that's quite the case. I just don't think <clears throat> that we have learned how to fish for people. <laughs> Maybe that ought to be our prayer. Lord, teach us how to fish for people. But that means that, that something has got to be uh, evident in us that makes uh, people attracted to us. That's why you have to be careful what you say, where you go, <laughs> what you do. I remember we gave Charles Barkley a hard time uh, a few years ago when he said that he wasn't a role model. He didn't want to be anybody's role model. And, uh, you know, I guess Charles Barkley had to think about that, but people scorched him. You don't want to be a role model, but you want your big face on television giving commentary during the basketball season. You want to be in commercials. You 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 want to be seen, but but you don't want to have any responsibility. Can't have it both ways. Can't have it both ways. These folks saw something in Jesus and they followed him. Nobody else had ever come to where they were. And I'm so glad that Jesus is still coming where we are. Coming to where we are. Aren't you glad about that? <clears throat> I know that if I opened up this line, there'd be a lot of horror stories <clears throat> about people who have looked over you, disregarded you, disrespected you, maybe even disowned you, didn't think that you were good enough, didn't think that you measured up, looked down on you. But I'm so glad that that is not Jesus' M.O. He came into all of our situations. And he spoke peace to our spirits. That's why we are as far as we are by the grace of God. And then Jesus raised up some folks that saw some, something in us and gave us a helping hand. Aren't you glad about it? Somebody ought to be praising God with me. I, I, I bless God's holy name. But I just wanted to share this insight because I, I don't think that it's, it's, it's spoken enough. It, it, it's not talked about enough. That, uh, yeah, Jesus had... Uh, a tax collector and, and uh, arguably uh, Jesus had a physician uh, and, and maybe the tax collector, uh, he had a couple, he had two tax collectors, if I'm not mistaken, you all do the homework. And uh, maybe they had the equivalent training of a CPA, I don't know. But I do know that he had, uh, within his inner circle, Jesus had a mixed multitude. And, and <clears throat> he worked with them so that they could ultimately work with each other.
And that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. That, that's, that's the way we're supposed to roll. But I pray that in the ensuing, <clears throat> the remaining four weeks of this blessed season of Epiphany, that we will ask God to help us fish for people. And yes, it would be nice if these people uh, became members of our assembly. They, they joined Calvary, but that's not the most important thing. As long as they join Christ, and, and hopefully they can find a place uh, where they can root ground, ground themselves and grow. But if you're, if you're uh, speaking the right stuff, if, if you're, you know, if you're an example, if you're allowing your light to shine, they'll probably want to come where you're hanging out. <clears throat> How about that? I hope that this has blessed you. I, I hope it has helped you. I hope it has encouraged you. Let's pray. Gracious and ever living God, we, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for your model. We thank you for your example. We thank you, God, that we can study you We can take your yoke upon us and learn of you. For you are meek and lowly in heart and we shall find rest for our souls. For your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We thank you. We thank you, God, that You've left us here for a reason, to do good and to learn lessons. Help us to cast our nets and fish for people. May they see something in us that will stir something in them we thank you and we praise you God for the light in us we ask you to touch heal deliver We thank you for this time together. We love you and we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Appreciate you hanging in here with me. Another week. I want to give you something that uh, that will bless you as it has been blessing me. This was one of my uh, workout songs, one of my gym songs when I was uh, away last week. Uh, and I pray, I mean, it really, it really helped me. <laughs> helped me get over the hump. Do you hear me? Sometimes you just, you need a little uh, moving music uh, when you're exercising uh, to kind of get it together. Uh, this is from the Chicago Mass Choir. I love this song. God is my everything. Be blessed. Wait, 
Thank you, God. Get the blood coursing through your veins. God is my everything. Thursday night, join the fellowship hour on the conference call line. Friday night, join the prayer line on the conference call line. Sunday morning, join us for worship in person and on our virtual platforms. 10 o'clock. U.S. Eastern Time. Remember, whatever you're going through, God is your everything. Thank you for sharing with me tonight. Love you. God bless.